Good, welcome all. It's so good to see you all again. I know I enjoy teaching the Word of God because it's a living Word. And quite often I get excited when I hear some feedback from what I've taught. Uh, one of the things I pray for every week, I take time one day to sit in my chair and reminisce about my life and about the many places I've been and many places I've had opportunity to minister. And then I ask the Lord, I say things like this, Lord, I try to spread your word. I sometimes I did it well, sometimes I did it poorly. But it's your word, it's your seed. And you, you promised, Lord Jesus, that that seed will bring forth fruit and never return void. And so today, um, August the 19th, 2020, I ask, Lord, that somewhere in the world, you will bring to somebody's mind something I taught or something I wrote or something I preached that will be a blessing to them and cause them to draw closer to you. It may have been preached 20 years ago, but I want it to still be effective today. Well, this afternoon, we had one of those moments when a lady telephoned me from Kitchener, which is where my first church was in Ontario. I was there in the uh, 75 to, on 79 to 83. And she telephoned today and said that she was reading through an old book of hers and she came across a saying that I told them, Christ did not call us to stand in the world to give a witness of Christ. He called us to stand in Christ and be a witness to the world. And she wanted to write to me today to say what an impact that had had upon her life. And it's always exciting when you get that kind of thing. And I just pray that these times of teaching, as we've gone through the book of Ephesians, that God will plant in you some seed that, will, that you'll remember the rest of your life, that will impact you for the rest of your life, and will draw you closer to him. That's the purpose of all my teaching, that we might get close to the Lord. Amen? Amen? You nod if you say amen. Yeah, <laughs> you can't say it, but it's fine. Okay, tonight we're going to do like an overview of the book of Hebrew, of Ephesians. I will be touching on some of the things I taught, uh, but I, I probably do some other things as well. There are many, many ways this book can be divided up. Now, I started off by telling you about the simple way of the book I've read called Sit, Walk, Stand. And I recommend that book if you've never read it. It's only about 90 pages long. But Watchman Nee, who was imprisoned in China for many years, used to send letters from his prison cell to his congregation. And they gathered these letters together into books. And that is how the book Sit, Walk, Stand came to be. And of course, Sit, we saw in chapter two, we sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then in chapter four and five, therefore walk in light, walk in love, walk in a manner worthy of your calling, walk. And then last week, we looked into chapter six, where he says, therefore stand, put on the whole armor of God and stand. That's one way to divide the book. The way I taught it this last 10 weeks was according to the way that I was invited once to speak at a Cape Ray school in Australia. And they gave me 10 weeks and I was to be an hour every week, every year, I'm sorry. They gave me a week of teaching for 10 sessions, I'm sorry. And each session was one hour long. So I took 10 items out of the book of Ephesians and I concentrated on those items. So one day I talked about being filled with the spirit. Another day I talked about being seated in Christ. And that is the way I've taught the course with you. Of course, uh, there are many, I didn't exegete from chapter one, verse one, continuously as many pastors and teachers would do. There are other ways that it can be divided. And I just picked up this little book today and I'm just gonna read some of the things uh, from this book as a background. And then I'm gonna to present to you a different way of looking at the book of Ephesians. This is some of the background information first. Um, the writer Paul, written from Rome, about AD 62. On the return portion of Paul's second missionary journey, he came to Ephesus in Asia Minor, and he preached there one Sabbath in the synagogue, and left behind Priscilla and Aquila to continue his work. He was just there one day, or one preaching session. On his third missionary journey, you remember Paul went on three missionary journeys, the third one he came back to Jerusalem, there he was taken prisoner and brought ultimately to Rome. On his third missionary journey, he stayed at Ephesus for three years, founding and establishing a church there. On his way back from that third missionary trip, he called for the Ephesus elders to come and meet with him, and he shared with them all that he had taught on the rest of the journey before he ultimately came back to Jerusalem. During his first part of his Roman captivity, the apostle was stirred up to think particularly of the Gentile Christians, or at least churches where Gentiles predominated. Therefore, he wrote letters to them, and that is a letter to the Colossians, letter to the Galatians, letter to the Philippians, 
and that those letters were written from his prison cell in Rome, together with a letter to Philemon. You remember that letter? It was just a single chapter where Onesimus, a runaway slave, has come to faith in Christ. Paul has discipled him and is now sending him back to effort to his master, Philemon. And uh, in Colossae, he's sending Tychicus with him to be his companion. And then he writes the letter to the Ephesians. Now, I told you before that uh, um, his letter to the Colossians is a very wonderful letter. But having written that, he talked much about the supremacy of Christ. And Paul gets carried away with this thought of the supremacy of Christ. That he begins to write the second letter to the, we call it to the Ephesians. It's more a circular letter. It's going to be spread to all the churches of Asia Minor, in which he builds on this uh, thought that is within him, this wonderful thought of the supremacy of Christ. And in the two letters, there are about 55 verses that are quoted verbatim the same in both letters. This is, I'm just going to give some opinion from this little booklet I've got. These are different, what different people have said about the book of Ephesians. The city of Ephesus, first, let's talk about that. It was situated in Lydia, about 40 miles from Smyrna. Do you remember Smyrna and Ephesus were two of the letters in the book of Revelation? It was a place of considerable commerce, a very wealthy city. It was also noted for its magnificent temple of Artemis, which was from very ancient times the center of worship of that goddess. The goddess Artemis was worshipped throughout Asia, but the church, the temple, magnificent temple in Ephesus, the ruins are still there, uh, was the center of such worship. The temple, the original one, was burnt down in 355 BC, but rebuilt at immense cost and was one of the wonders of the ancient world. So when Paul was there, this was quite a, quite a place to be. Uh, this the temple was 450 feet long and 220 feet in breadth. That's, you picture that, that's quite a size, 450 feet, that's what, 150 yards. All of Asia contributed to its erection and the 127 magnificent columns supported it bestowed upon it by many kings and rulers from the neighboring areas around Asia. So though it was in Ephesus, this became the center of Artemis worship, and all of the rest of Asia saw this as the center of their worship. Little models of this temple, this magnificent building, were made in silver with the image of the goddess enshrined in them. And they were made for sale and sold in large quantities. And you can read about this in Acts chapter 19, when Paul comes here, and of course, the sales of these are hindered by them, people becoming Christians. And of course, the salespeople and the men making profit from these are very, very angry. I told you that one of the definitions I like about the book of Ephesians is that it's the queen of the epistles. It is written in magnificent form. It's poetic in form. And Paul runs away oftentimes just pouring out his heart so fast that his scribe cannot write it down fast enough. There are long portions without any punctuation. Uh, other th things you said about it, uh, these are quotes. It is the manifesto of the church's ultimate vocation. It is the book that tells us what our ultimate position will be to reign with Christ. Uh, we may speak of Ephesians as the rich epistle of the God, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rich in mercy tells us of the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Another man called it the third heaven epistle. Remember Paul? talked about once being raised into a third heaven where he had visions of God that he could not even utter. Well, somebody calls this the third heaven epistle. For in it, Paul soars from the depths of man's ruin, the hopeless state that we were in, to the heights of redemption. Another man calls this book the Alps of the New Testament, the mountains that are in Switzerland and Italy and France, the Alps of the New Testament. For here we are bidden by God to mount step by step until we reach the highest possible point where man can stand, even in the presence of God himself. It's an invitation to draw near to God, this epistle. The word workmanship in chapter 2, verse 10, this is the key verse of the letter. This is what it says. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. And God has planned that. And the word um, workmanship there is the Greek word, says this man, poema, from which we get the word poem. 
And the thought comes through, and I expressed this to you in my first teaching, that this is a letter that's a poem about God. It speaks of the heart of God being expressed to us through his grace, through his love. It is a beautiful thought, says this writer, in itself to think of those who are saved by grace and united to Christ. It's a beautiful thought to think of them as the poem of God, God's expression of his love, the expression of God's most exalted and superlative thought. The word poemia may also be rendered masterpiece or masterwork. The church is God's masterpiece. And here's my last comment. This is comments from different writers say these things. Here we have the highest revelation of the church as the body, the church as a building, the church as the bride of Christ. We saw that in our teaching. And then we have the highest revelation of a Christian as raised and seated and reigning with Christ. And thirdly, it's a high revelation of a Christian character of acting in a particular way, walking and talking like Christ. And so there are some opinions that people have, other people, when they look at the book of Ephesians. And it is all these things to us. And I don't know which of those, in any, if any of them resonated with you as I read them fairly quickly, I know. But I want you to get the picture that many, many scholars look at this book and they have a different reaction to it. It means so much in different ways to many different people. Another one of the divisions, uh, it's a very natural division in the book, is between chapter three, end of chapter three, first three chapters, and the last three, uh, three chapters. Chapter four starts with this word, therefore. But the first three chapters are dealing with theology. And the last three chapters are dealing with lifestyle that comes out of that theology. And one of the divisions I have is that it calls the first part of the book, the first three chapters, the gospel story. And the chapters four to six, our story, our testimony. What are we doing with this? Huh? Let's look at it in overview, and then I look at some of my notes and gather some with you. Chapter one, Paul starts with a greeting, grace and peace to you from God our Father. And then this verse in chapter verse three, blessed, praise be to God for what he's done. And then Paul talks about some of the things he's done and that phrase in Christ comes up all the time. What has God done? He's redeemed us, he's purchased us, he's brought us to himself. He has poured out lavishly upon us his grace He's poured out his mercy upon us. And all of this is in Christ. And the picture I like to get is that when we're in Christ, God pours out these blessings upon his son because his son is the apple of his eye. Jesus is the one whom God loves and, and has great relationship. You know, sometimes we think, uh, I've heard Christians say this all, oh, thank God we're the apple of his eye. We're not the apple of God's eye. Jesus is the apple of God's eye. But you and I are in him. And when God looks at his son, it is with such great love. But in son, loving his son, he is loving us. Why? Because we're in Christ Jesus. And God pours his blessings upon his son. And we are the recipients of those blessings, having been brought into his son through faith, through grace. We've been born again into his son. And we, we're inheritors of all the riches of Christ for us. The other, second thing Paul does in this early chapter, he talks about we the Jews, and then he talks about you. And every time Paul talks about you in this letter, he's referring to the Gentiles, because this is really a letter written to Gentile Christians. You, you were once dead in trespasses and sins. You were once lost uh, in chapter two. It talks about, you were once without hope in this world. You were dead. You formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power. That is how you were. And we Jews also were in that state. We had no hope. But God, verse 3, chapter 2, verse 4, be enriched in his mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead like this, he raised us up. He's not raised the Jew up. He's not raised the Gentile. He's raised us both up. And made of both of us a one people, become a, bi a multinational body of Christ. It's not just the Jews now. It is Greeks, it is Gentiles, it's Canadians, it's Welsh, it's Americans, it is whatever you are. We're all being brought together in Christ. And Paul celebrates this and worships God for it. We've been brought one. And then, of course, the, the prayer he starts in chapter one, 
as he breaks into his thought, he breaks into prayer and longs that you and I might know God in a deep experiential way. I want you Gentiles to know the supreme, surpassing power of God. You know, the early church, the Jews had experienced the great power of God on the day of Pentecost. But he wants the Gentiles to experience God in a similar way. And he's praying for them. He's got this picture of one church, one people. And then, of course, he presents it as the body of Christ. He presents it as a building fitly framed together. And then in chapter 3, having presented all the riches of being in Christ, and then in chapter 2, he comes and says, we're seated in heavenly place in Christ. I took a whole series teaching you on that. And then he said these words, we are no longer strangers and aliens, but we've been brought into a living relationship with Jesus, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, it's chapter 2, verse 20, in whom the whole building fitly framed together is growing to be a holy habitation for the Lord, Jew and Gentile together. And then he takes time out in verse 3. He talks about his ministry in chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard of my stewardship, I want to tell you a little bit about my calling. By revelation, a mystery was made known to me. I wrote about it briefly before, but now I want you to understand this mystery. This mystery is that God now is re that is revealed to his holy person, prophets, the prophets and apostles. This is the mystery, to be specific in verse 6, that you Gentiles are also heirs and fellow members of the, promise, of the body. You're fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. So all that the prophets spoke about, all the promises were given to the Jews, you also, Gentiles, are to be partakers of that. This is the mystery. This is something that was known before. At the time of Paul, even then, the, the Jews looked upon Gentiles as dogs. But Peter, remember Peter had the wonderful vision of the sheet coming down from heaven and the animals upon the sheet. He was told to slay and to eat. And he said, I can't touch unclean things. And God said, do not call unclean what I call clean. He sends Peter to Cornelius. Peter comes back amazed that God had poured out his spirit among the Gentiles also. And now Paul has taken up the mantle as the apostle to the Gentiles. I have been made a minister of this, verse 7, according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me. God has poured out grace upon me. He's given me a gift, a burden to minister to the Gentiles and to minister to you the unfathomable riches of Christ. To me, the very least of saints, verse 8, chapter 3, God has given this grace gift to preach to you and to bring to light the administration of the mystery, which for ages was hidden in God, the creator of all things, so that the manifest wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places, that the angels might see that God's purpose from eternity was not just for the Jewish people, but was that you and I, Gentile people, will be brought into. This is in accordance with the eternal purposes he had. We have access and boldness and confidence who have come before him. Therefore, do not be, do not lose heart at my sorrows here in prison in Rome, for they are your glory. And I bow my knee before God, that he will grant to you, again he comes back to prayer, that he would grant to you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. That's the gospel story. That's chapters one to three. That in Christ we have all these riches. In Christ God looks at us and he loves us. He loves all mankind that he sent his only begotten son, but it's a special way that he pours love upon his son. And in him he when we're in him, he doesn't see our sin because, as I like to say, the sun, S-O-N, gets in his eyes. The sun, his son Jesus, is the glory of God. That is where he pours out all his affection, his love. And you and I being in him, he receives us in Christ Jesus. There is nothing in us that merits God accepting us. There is nothing in us, in us that causes us, that gives us the right to access God. But in Christ Jesus, 
All our sins are dealt with. All our past is forgiven and God looks and welcomes us in. Just like Noah in the ark was saved from the flood. Not because he built an ark, not because he believed God, but because he's in the ark. And furthermore, seven other people entered the ark too. And God sealed them in. And because they were in the ark, they were delivered. It's the same with you and me. We entered into Christ through the new birth. He granted to you and me the faith to appropriate the saving work of the cross. And he came by his spirit to dwell in us. He made us his own, but he took us also. Not only did he come to dwell in us, but he took us also to be in him. And in him all the riches of chapter 2. And Paul said, oh, isn't this thrilling? I want you to know the height, the depth, and all the love of God might be poured upon you. And then as he's thinking of these words, remember he's in the prison cell all the time he's thinking this. And then he says, oh, oh. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think, according to the power which works within us, to him, to him, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and forever. Amen. And that's the gospel story. It was foreordained by God from eternity past. Was the was death of Jesus on the cross an accident? No. It was the price that God knew needed to be paid for your mind redemption. You remember Abram was asked to bring Isaac to a sacrifice. He brought him up and the lad said to his father, the father, where he's carrying the wood for the fire. When they get there, he says to his father, the father, where, where's the sacrifice? And Abram said prophetic words, my son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. You remember he went to slay Isaac and God stayed his hand and promised Abraham through his faithfulness and through Isaac and through Jacob, he would bless the nations of the world. And you and I are recipients of that blessing. That's the gospel. So what do we do with it? Well, that's what chapter four starts. Therefore, whenever I read the word therefore, I always ask myself the question, what's it therefore? It's there because it links the first three chapters to the last three. It says, if all this is true in your life, if all, all of this rings a bell with you, if all of this causes your heart to rejoice, therefore, walk it out. If you've learned to sit in Christ Jesus, if you've learned what the blessings are of being in Christ Jesus, walk it out. Therefore, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, but I implore you, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. If you've been called out of darkness into light, if you've been called out of the bondage, if you've been called from death into life, walk it out. Walk it out worthily. And then Paul gives us some examples. These are edicts, these are precepts of the Christian life. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit. We're called to unity. We're not called to division. We're not called to uniformity either. We're not, you know, the ecumenical movement is calling churches to uniformity, so we all agree. He's not calling us to that. He's calling us to recognize unity. Unity in the body means people in the Pentecostal, the Baptist, the Catholic, the, church, the Methodist, whatever church you belong to is irrelevant so long as you're in Christ. And there's a unity among the people in Christ. It's already there. We don't have to create that unity, but we call to live it out. I'd rather treat a man as my brother when maybe he's not than not treat him as my brother, when in reality he is. There is one body, there is one spirit, there is one hope, there is one calling, there is one Lord, there is one faith, there is one baptism. Walk in unity, there is just one. How many, how many temples is Christ building? One. And you and I are part of that temple, a living temple. How many bodies is Christ the head of? One. And he's asking you and me to be part of that body, to work together in unity, in the unity of the Spirit of God. I may have told you this story, some of you have heard, I'm sure. Uh, I often ask my congregation, how many churches are there in Victoria? And people will all say, they're trying to guess, maybe 50, maybe 100. They're trying to guess. I say, don't you know, I know how many churches there are in Victoria. One. Or oh, say, so many different uh, forms and many different congregations, but there's only one church in Jesus Christ. And that church extends far beyond Victoria to Ontario, to Florida, wherever we're from. 
across their seas into Europe, to Soviet Union, to Iran, to the Middle East, to India. There's one church and one body, and the head of that church is Jesus Christ. And you and I are privileged people to be part of it. Therefore, walk in a manner worthy, said Paul. And then he goes on further and he talks about this walk. He says to us that Jesus Christ, how do, how do we walk in this unity? Well, to help you do so, I've given you gifts. Jesus gave gifts to his body. In chapter 12 of Romans, in 1 Corinthians 12, we have many of those gifts. But here in Ephesians, he lists for us five gifts. Jesus said, I give to my bride the gift of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And I think those last two are the leadership of local churches. The others, I think, are wider than the local church. But those last two pastors and teachers are the body and church. And this is what he says, that they might be used to equip the saints for the work of ministry. I don't know where your work location is, but the church's role is to equip you for ministry in, in, that, in that place. Uh, some of you know, those who know me well know, I have a, a passion for the university here in Victoria. Uh, my, I see myself as being involved with students there and I try to equip them to be good soldiers on the campus. Uh, when I go to the campus, uh, as I do every Monday, I do a prayer walk with one of the boys there, Miles. Uh, as I go there, there's a bus terminus in the campus of UVic. And many buses are waiting there to do their route. And on these buses, while they're waiting, is written, not in service. And that saddens me so much when I think of the many Christians who are on campus who are not in service. And the failure of the church is to equip them for the work of ministry in their location. Their location is the campus. And church pastors, to me, and I'm, I'm on my soapbox right now, church pastors' responsibility should be to equip them to be the best witness and the best Christians, to walk in a manner worthy, walk in the light, on the campus. I don't know where you work. My friend Brian here works in a, a Costco. Are you still working in Costco, Brian? No, <laughs> I'm, I'm, he was working. <coughs> my, my, my job as a pastor would be to encourage Brian, to help Brian to be the best person he can be on his work. So Jesus said, I'm going to give you these gifts to enable you to walk worthily, to equip you for the work of ministry. That is what the role of pastors and churches should be. We're not supposed to be inward looking. Uh, community or social clubs. We're supposed to be in a ministry of sending out, equipping saints for the work of ministry. So Paul says that Jesus says that he's going to give gifts to his bride. And these gifts are those to enable them to work out their ministry, to work out their calling, to walk worthily. Then he goes into verse 17 of chapter 4 and he says, walk, don't walk like the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. Their understanding is darkened but you have light, so walk in the light. Let Jesus be your guide. The steps that you take, walk in the path that he shows you. And then he talks about various aspects. And we talk about this in my teaching, so I'm not gonna go over it again. Um, then he comes into chapter five, the imitators and walk in love. Walk out what you've learned, walk out to your experience. You're in Christ Jesus, now walk it out in your life. Walk it out in love. Not in immorality or impurity or greed that must not exist among you. Uh, there shouldn't be lies. Uh, take off the old, cast off the old person, put on the new. Take off your lies and put on truth. Put away anger, take on peace. Put away theft, take on generosity. Put away gossip, take on encouragement. Put away revenge and take on, uh, I can't read my nose, happy, uh, forgiveness. Put away uh, promis promiscuity and take on cleanliness, put away drunkenness and take on God's spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit of God. And then he gives those three examples that I taught you. For those who are filled with the spirit, and I, I assume you all long to be filled with the spirit of God. The evidence of that is the next three verses, where he says words like this, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. A man or woman who is filled with the spirit will be a worshiper. Next verse says this, being thankful in all things, for this is the will of Christ, will of God in Christ Jesus. Be thankful. Don't tell me your spirit fill if you're grumbling all the time. And then thirdly, live to honor one another. Be submitted to one another in love. The word submission means to honor one another. 
And that's living out the Christian life. That's living out the gospel. This must be my story. I've heard the gospel story with all the good news that I as a Gentile can be accepted in Christ. I knelt by my bed as a 16 year old and I looked to Jerusalem. I looked to the Lamb of God that was slain there on Calvary. And I became by faith a child of Abraham. I was adopted into the family of God. But because of that, and to walk this out, I have to live my life story now. My life story is a witness. I'm going to walk in a manner of wood. I'm going to walk in love. My neighbors must see something different in me. My, my neighbors must see I'm a different person than the world. And this is what Paul is saying. Walk in love. Put away the old man. Take on the new. You have the Holy Spirit to help you. The Holy Spirit will give you strength to do this. But take on this. And then he said, having learned to walk this way, Oh, some, let me come back. Be filled with spirit. And then he gives us those examples of the godly home where the husband and wife are walking in the fullness of spirit. He talks about the relationship between parents and the children. Can you imagine if we had this kind of relationship where fathers nurtured their children and put love into that little love tank of a child? And I said what love was, it's security, identity, value, esteem. It's not just cuddles and kisses and toys at Christmas. It's all these things that build up a whole person. And if we as fathers and mothers, but if we built into our children those things, we wouldn't have the, pro the problem children we have today. We wouldn't have those high on drugs because of the wounds that they experienced in their childhood. But the world, the world is going to produce that. But we as Christians should be children who walk in, in the spirit and our children should grow up in that kind of security. And then he said, if uh, you employees and you employers, you should have this dynamic of relationship of spirit-filled believers. And then he concludes and he goes on and he says, this life we are called to live, children of God, Gentiles adopted into the family, the living place of God, the temple of God, the body of Christ. With all of this, live it out in love and in light and in a manner worthy. And when you live it out, there's going to come opposition to you. Therefore, stand. Put on the armor of God. Equip yourself for the battle. Take the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. Having your shoes girt with the gospel of peace. Be ready to move at all times. This is the way you live it out your life. And then take the sword of the spirit, which is an offensive weapon. And in prayer and supplication, and come against the force of darkness. And learn to be an overcomer. Learn to stand. And as you overcome, God will make himself more manifest to you will make his will put known to you. I like the letter of John. I told you this one. John says there, uh, to them that overcomes. John, in Revelation, in all the seven letters, John says, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes, I will grant this. I will give that. Overcoming. We're in a battle. And I think Christians love to be content in where they're at. They fail to see there's a battle going on. It's not between Jesus and Satan. It's between you and Satan's hordes. But he's a defeated foe. And Jesus expects you and me to be overcomers. And so when the offenses come, when the lies come, when the roaring lion comes, how are you going to react? When you know your security in Christ, when you react by that way, when you take on the armor of God, when you take the sword of faith, when you take the word of God to quench the fiery arrows of the, of the evil one, you overcome and God makes himself known to you. I think that's an exciting journey. And I'm glad I'm on that journey. And I'm glad you're on that journey with me. And I pray that this book of Ephesians has been a blessing to you as I've taught it to you. If you haven't got all the 10 series of notes, please let me know by email and I will gladly send you the notes so you have a full set of my notes on it. But I just pray that you just don't pass it off now, but that you will spend some time overlooking the notes, coming back and maybe reading the book a couple of times more, asking God to speak to you. And maybe God gives you a gem from this book that I've missed, because there are many, many gems in this book. It's a rich, rich book of God's riches for you. And I'm sure as you read it, something will stand out and you say, ah, oh, that's for me. That's for me. And that's my prayer for you. So let me end with the same prayer we started with. May the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, grant to you wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of himself, that you might know the hope of his calling. You might know his inheritance among the saints. You might know the superior power of his spirit working in you. God bless you. This has been a joy to be with you.